welcome back to our second lecture. This is module two on the rise of sport in the 19th century. We'll be taking from Gems chapters three through four and Wiggins chapters uh, four and five. Roughly the first half of this lecture is gonna consider healthy forms and sport in the antebellum area. We'll cover roughly 1820 through 1860. Antebellum reformers had a number of key agendas that they focused on. First was education reform. Thought behind this was to educate youth, particularly on the proper morals um, of a nation. Second was abolitionism, this idea of abolishing slavery. Third was women's rights. Fourth was temperance, or this idea of self-restraint moderation. It typically surrounded issues of abstinence from alcohol. The purpose of this was that abolitionists were concerned with nationalism. They wanted to establish a country or a nation that had strong physically and morally citizens in order that they could advance the nation. Again, going back to our concept of nationalism. Throughout the antebellum period, there were a number of key things that happened in the U.S. Remember, this is roughly 1820 to 1860. The nation was focusing on growth, and in order to grow, it had to separate itself from Britain, and that ultimately became a focus. Ways that they did this was through sport. Also, it should be noted that there were a couple key things that happened, particularly surrounding the Second Great Awakening, where there became this connection between physical and moral health. Also, there was a growth of manufacturing, and as I've talked before um, in the first lecture, there was also this connection to science, um, which ultimately then there was some separation from religion. And we'll see in just a little bit where there will ultimately be a push to return to religious ideals. Throughout this era, the roughly 1820s through the 1860s, America experienced tremendous growth. And some viewed this as a notion of manifest destiny. That is, this growth was a fulfillment of God's plan. It essentially gave a moral reasoning for conquering native land and ultimately native people. The downside of this is that it reinforced whiteness or the notion of white rights and privileges. Obviously, this concept was highly controversial then, and you can argue it's still highly controversial now. However, it does give some reasoning and rationale behind the thought of conquering land and ultimately native people. Muscular Christianity was also a key doctrine that was followed in this era. It connected notions of muscles, morals, and manliness to what was essential for a white American male in this democratic culture. It made the connection between this idea that our body was the temple of God, therefore mind, body, and spirit all needed to be exercised. Throughout this era, things such as the YMCA and the YMHA developed and were popular in shaping young males throughout the antebellum era. The role of physical activity for women throughout the antebellum era looked different especially as uh, a woman's role was typically multifaceted. Not only was she supposed to be wife and mother, she was supposed to be the guardian of morals and ultimately the nurturer for children. In order to be able to do this, uh, a woman needed vigorous health. It became evident, though, that health was lacking because women were not afforded opportunities for physical activity. Also throughout the antebellum era, in steps Catherine Beecher who is key in pushing for women's physical activity. She came from an influential family and ultimately was an educator with in physical education for girls. She pushed also for women's rights um, and advocated for those in books that she wrote. Physical activity for women throughout the antebellum era was largely restricted by restrictive clothing. It was difficult for women to take part in physical activity and engage in daily activities because of the traditional restrictive clothing that they wore. In comes bloomers. 
This is kind of a fun story of how this transpired. Elizabeth Smith Miller sought comfort while she was gardening, and in doing so, she put on male clothing or pants. She shared this with her cousin, Elizabeth Stanton, and Elizabeth Stanton ultimately talked about this with her neighbor, Amelia Jenks Bloomer, hence Bloomers. Bloomer advocated for these pant-like articles of clothing in her paper, The Lily. What this ultimately did is Bloomers were symbolic of freedom for women. Essentially, wearing bloomers allowed women to participate in physical activity. There was freedom of movement. Um, <clears throat> these wearing of male-like clothing allowed them to be active in farm life, gardening, and other forms of physical activity. Wearing this male clothing, though, in public challenged traditional gender norms or roles as women took a step away from traditional female clothing. It's important to note that throughout the antebellum era, sporting practices looked different across urban and rural settings. Urban life touted technological advances and ultimately sporting advantages over those that lived in rural settings. Rural settings surrounded outdoor life. For women, it was difficult to be able to handle the outdoor life as well as have time left for leisure activities. It should also be noted, though, that in rural America throughout the antebellum era, baseball became widely played and popular. One key figure throughout the antebellum era was journalist John Stuart Skinner. Skinner wrote in The American Farmer. And in establishing The American Farmer, he also developed two special departments. He began writing in a sports section and a women's section. Therefore, Information was disseminated to groups throughout the country through Skinner's publication. And in doing so, he often wrote about how he believed exercise, recreation, and sporting pursuits were essential to well-rounded Americans. Throughout this era, urban areas in our country experienced tremendous increase in population. Therefore, parks became an important place that provided areas or grounds for play. It should be noted that in 1850, New York Central Park was the first landscape park to derive in the U.S. Also throughout this time, though, public parks were contested spaces. That is, what groups, cultures could use these spaces, and ultimately, what were appropriate activities for these public spaces. As we saw in our first lecture, Sporting practices often differed based upon cultural groups. And in the antebellum era, this is not different. Sporting practices for African Americans often also differed. Um, those slaves in the South could be found in participating in boxing matches and also horse racing. However, for free Northern slaves, they lacked opportunities for physical activity and sport. Sport for Native Americans also looked different throughout this antebellum era. Nomadic life continued as white settlers forced Native American groups to move further west. Lacrosse was still a very popular sport for Native American groups, and it even became a commonplace for whites to be spectators at these lacrosse games. Also in the 1830s, many Native Americans began to take up running and even running became an anthropological way that whites racialized the bodies of Native Americans. Throughout the antebellum era, sport was really important for immigrant groups as it provided a way to maintain practices from the homeland. Sport provided a place to create their own physical and cultural spaces and as you can see in the slide, various immigrant groups partook in various activities that were relative to those at which they took part in in their homeland. As we continue to move on to talk about sport in the 19th century, the remaining portion of our lecture is going to discuss rationalized and modern sport. It will cover the time frame of roughly 1850 to 1870. Even as early as the 1850s, media began to influence sport. 
Americans were able to read about games, get a count of the game, as well as scores of the game in various newspapers and sporting journals. Americans also learned about the, the rules of sport and various equipment they could use in sport in manuals and advice books. Some examples of those are included on that right hand side of your slide. Previously in this lecture, we talked about the difference between rural and urban settings for sport. It ultimately is important to recognize that the rise of the city had a strong influence on modern day sport. And I'm going to read this quote to you from Reese because it is important. The evolution of the city more than any other single factor influenced the development of organized sport and recreational athletic pastimes in America. Made nearly all contemporary major sports involved, evolved or were invented in the city. How is that so? Urban settings offered better transport, both physically and communication, with railroad and telegraph. In addition, the cities were often filled with diverse groups, even diverse immigrant groups. This meant oftentimes diverse perspectives and even diverse sporting practices that individual immigrant groups brought from their homelands. Throughout the antebellum era, it was also important to recognize that community strongly impacted modern sport. These community groups oftentimes were centered around sport themselves, and it offered a way for community groups to segregate themselves from others. Oftentimes though, membership in these community groups or these sporting groups depended largely on either the wealth, the gender, or the race of the group in question. It ultimately served as a badge of exclusivity for a group of men who um, joined these sporting pursuits as a way to separate themselves from other groups. One of the sporting groups to develop was the sporting fraternity. They called themselves the Fancy. This group developed in contrast to class-driven clubs. It was a group of working class men, oftentimes from ethnic minorities. These sporting, this sporting fraternity surrounded oftentimes drinking and gambling. Some of the effects of sporting fraternity often were found in that the emphasis was not on health of sport, but rather profit and victory. Underground activities began to develop that surrounded gambling and drinking, and those underground activities included such things as bare knuckle boxing, tavern billiards, and cockfighting. In addition to the sporting fraternity, a number of other sporting clubs developed throughout this era. Several of those sporting clubs surrounded gymnastics and active bodies. Muscular Christianity was represented in the YMCA, and the Jewish community encouraged physical activity through their YMHA. For women, ladies' auxiliaries grew throughout this time, offering an opportunity for women to get together surrounding sport. In addition to the growth of sporting clubs, team sports also saw a rise throughout this era. Baseball emerged from the numerous bat and ball games. Although cricket was the first major team sport in America, cricket ultimately lost favor to baseball in the 1850s because America wanted a game that would result or was a development of U.S. culture. One of the things that's interesting to note that Goldstein talks about this at length in Wiggins chapter 5. He gives this vivid account of how baseball ultimately became the great American pastime. This was really a result of Americans wanting to have a game that was overwhelmingly American and that it devolved around American culture. As modern sport grew, so did the growth of intercollegiate sport. Some interesting facts include that the first intercollegiate sporting event happened in 1852. It was a crew race between Yale and Harvard. In 59, the first intercollegiate baseball game was played. 69, the first intercollegiate football game. 73, we saw the first intercollegiate track and field meet. And then in 1891, we saw that first intercollegiate basketball game. A couple other fun facts surrounding that first sporting event between Yale and Harvard. Yale and Harvard, um, took part in races in 1855, 59, 60, and 64, and it ultimately then became an annual regatta. 
some early controversy surrounding collegiate sport was this concept that Yale hired a professional coach in 1864 to run its crew team. This ultimately became um, scandal, um, the first early scandal, we could argue, of intercollegiate sport, one that we will see happened many times after. Modern sport was ultimately impacted in the early 1860s by the Civil War. Although many people still found time for sport and leisure activities, it just looks slightly different. Following the Civil War in roughly 1865, soldiers continued to participate in sport after the war. And this war ultimately generated desire for military officers and troops to be trained physically and therefore all, uh, following the Civil War, colleges began to emphasize sport and physical activity programs. As I talked about in the first lecture, here are some questions for thought. Use these as a way to fact check yourself on the knowledge gained throughout the lecture. Answers to these questions can be found one in the lecture and two also the readings. Be able to answer these questions as you will see similar things going forward on quizzes and exams.